like fell him. That him is talking about Satan. And that's Satan's supposed to be lowercase right there. What's the little word that shall fell him? It's not a little word. It's Jesus. Amen. Jesus Christ is the one who will come. I want to turn family. at least 50% more of what you hear. In saying all that, let's go to prayer. Father God, thank you for this time together once again as we assemble before you and with you and we show our hearts that you may be able to take the tools of your work and work in us and carve out the, the foolishness <laughs> and replace it with <coughs> and direction. We pray, Lord, for the pastor this morning as he brings the word that each one of us could use a particular direction that we need, that you would take the word of God that he's named this morning and apply it to the, the hurt, the hunger, the desire, the pain that we have in each one of our lives. We are a needy church and we are a needy nation and our hope is in you. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for the cross. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. For those of you who are not aware, Randy is the chairman of the Deacons this year. And uh, they, he tried to get away, but they didn't let us. All right, kids, off we go. What makes God sad? Have you ever thought about that? In fact, some people are surprised when they look in Scripture that that idea is even there. The reality is that there are some things that the Word of God says does make Him sad. And if we certainly as His children could avoid anything, it would be the kinds of things that make God sad. Amen? So as uh, we continue in this series in Genesis, uh, we just want you to uh, put the pieces together. We uh, just sang a song that talked about our enemy and his power on earth and, and the fact that there's no one on earth that equals him. And yet compared to our God, he's just a created being that God can simply speak and do away with. And so as we go through this uh, journey as people who from Adam and Eve until the very last person is born and, and we know who has received Christ, who's been born again, all these kinds of things have happened. The focus never really is on me, on you, or even on the enemy. The focus is the reality that God is revealing himself to us and he is doing this work because he's a loving God, but he's doing it for his glory. And so as you and I think about this today, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Genesis chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 28. But uh, I want to ask you this question. If you were all-powerful, all-knowing, and totally self-sufficient, could there be anything that would make you sad? It would have to be something that uh, would be so very important to you. And as we look at this passage, uh, we see that the world has become quite a horrible place. Uh, it's about, uh, let's say, a thousand, five hundred years, maybe not quite that, into the process. And the world is becoming totally <coughs> sinful, not just in the hearts of men. We're all, we're all depraved and set apart from God. But overtly, openly, a horribly sinful place. And into this story we have Lamech who lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah. Sound familiar? And as you think about this uh, son, Noah, uh, 
Lamech is more than likely thinking about the curse that is on the world. And the fact that they're dealing with how difficult it is to grow things and all the corruption in the world that, that's so obvious. And so when Noah's born, as any dad uh, would be uh, ready to say, this child is special. This baby of mine is special. Uh, this one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground as God, the Lord is cursed. Now, it might just be, as you look at that passage, that Lamech was just looking for another farm hand. Ooh, this one here. He's going to go out there and hoe that stuff and I'm not going to have to hoe it anymore. No more weeds. Praise God. But actually, Lamech was the person who... Uh, walked with the Lord himself and you can see it in his son. And so often when you see character in, in a child, it's because parents have taken the time in family to build in the Word of God, to build in loving, godly discipline. And that shows in their children as well. Verse 31, it goes on to say that uh, so all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. You remember it's always putting that phrase on there because God told the people that Adam and Eve, if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what would happen? They would die. So God never hides the truth. It's just like Jesus talking more about hell than he did about heaven. He's not hiding the truth. He wants everybody to understand. So here is Noah 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Jacob. And so there might obviously have been other kids, but these are the ones that are listed. They're key to the story. Now you see the number of years. Noah is 500 years old at this time, and he is about to be given a great work, one that we'll be talking about more next week. Look at chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2, and now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for them whomever they chose. Now, uh, if you want to see a lot of material in commentaries that come out with, here's all the possibilities, and we'll find out when we get face to face with God. This is going to be one of those passages. The sons of God. Who are they? Well, if you look at the book of Job, the sons of God are angels. In this particular passage, you have then, if you take that understanding, angels who saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. Now, these are not going to be righteous angels. These are going to be a part of the third of the angels that Satan took with him. Uh, when he uh, left heaven pridefully determining that he was going to replace God. And so now he's the prince of the power of the air in the world. He has power and authority because Adam and Eve gave it over to him uh, when they sinned. And so there are some commentators who say that in fact what you have is fallen angels who are then taking uh, wives and that's more in the context of women. It's not a super strong word just to say wife. Uh, for themselves, whomever they chose. Now some people really don't like that interpretation. And you know how many interpretations there is, there would be for any one verse? Any one verse in the Bible, how many interpretations? One. Only one correct interpretation. There are a lot of different applications, but there's only the mind of God of what that verse was supposed to mean. There's only one interpretation. And so we're trying to discover what's going on that is causing the world to become so corrupt. Why is it becoming so overtly evil and, and just spreading like crazy? Well, the enemy, remember, is trying to do anything that he can to prevent that seed of Eve. Whoever's going to come and crush his head, he's trying to prevent that. So if he can corrupt the world, if he can find a way 
to cause all mankind to be evil, there would be no child that would come to crush his head. And so as these things are happening, some of the people who don't like that particular interpretation, they say, well, no, the sons of God, that would be the descendants of Seth. Adam's son, Seth. That's, that's the descendants of Seth. But you know, the descendants of Seth were not surprised at the fact that there were women around. And on top of that, it was, it was not that the sons of Seth were so godly and everything because if they were all such a godly group of people, how many of them would be on the ark? All of them, right? So if it's not that, then who is this? Well. As you go a little further, you look in verse 3, we're going to, it, they drop this piece in between. The Lord said, my spirit, capital S, shall not strive with man forever. Now the word Adam, man, is that same word. And so some people will say, well, maybe God is saying, I'm not going to put up with Adam forever. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's got a spirit, but he's also flesh. And I've got to deal with his flesh. But more commonly, uh, people understand this passage to mean that God looked at the situation in the world. None of this was a surprise. Absolutely, he knew everything that was going to happen from before the creation of the world. And he determined that he was going to shorten the lifespan of people in general to 120 years. So that they wouldn't have this kind of population explosion and the continual corruption of one generation affecting generation after generation indefinitely. You have other times where God does that. You remember what Jesus says when he, he talks about the fact that in the time of the great tribulation that God would do what to the time? He would shorten one. Because if he didn't, what would happen? Nobody would survive. And so God makes these kinds of choices. And so God is going to work in the lives of people that he is going to control uh, how those lives work out. Now let's get back to our other group in verse 4. The Nephilim. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Notice the highlight there. Uh, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. Ah, there they are again. Now here's our problem. The sons of God are not just saying, I like that one and I'll have one for a while. But they're coming into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. If that's sons of Seth, that makes sense. If that's angels, then since when can angels do that? Have you thought about that? Angels appear when they show up. What do they look like? Men. Show me one place in the scripture where an angel ever shows up anywhere in the Bible looking like a woman. Doesn't happen. There's only female, supernatural looking figures in one place. And it is when uh, evil, as the woman... Babylon is being delivered in a basket by two flying stork-like creatures. They're not ever in indicated as being good. So God has chosen when he sends a messenger from heaven to that they would have the appearance of a man. One of the things you remember if you've read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, they must be pretty good looking guys. Because every guy in town was after them. And in fact, would have raped them that night that they came uh, to bring their warning about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah had it not been for the fact that the angels basically struck them blind. And so these guys that are angels in whatever manifestation that they've taken are coming in and having kids. Now... Some people said, well, maybe they're just possessing men. There are powerful men, and these men are demon possessed, maybe even the women. And so now you have the situation where they're under the control of Satan because of demon possession. 
Well, the problem is, is that the scripture re uh, reveals that the Nephilim, or the Anakites, or their Rephidims, or whichever ones you want to talk about, are giants. And there's no reason to believe that a person would have giant children like Goliath simply because dad was demon possessed. So something is going on here that gives us the indication that at some point in time, angels stepped out of not only heaven, but out of the governing control and things that God had established. Is that possible? In the little book of Jude, chapter 6, we're going to look at that passage. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept.